I'm Sandy Arani, and I'm the Associate Director of the Simons Institute. Uh, many of you in the room are already familiar with the Simons Institute, but others who might be listening in, um, we are the leading uh, venue for collaborative research in theoretical computer science. And the Simons Institute was founded in 2012 with a very generous grant from the Simons Foundation. And we bring together researchers from all over the world um, to, and our programs focus on studying science engineering in the world through an algorithmic lens. And um, we bring in computer scientists and people from all kinds of related fields to study a, a great variety of topics. Um, a little bit about today's event. We are hybrid today. So if you're in the room, you can just raise your hand and ask a question. Um, and I will be monitoring online to see if we have anyone uh, attending remotely who would like to ask a question. Um, so this particular lecture series, the Richard M. Karp Distinguished Lecture Series, um, was founded to celebrate the many contributions of uh, the Simons Foundation's um, uh, founding director, uh, Richard M. Karp, and his many contributions in establishing the field of theoretical computer science and formulating its central problems. Um, we're very grateful to the many people who have contributed to make this particular lecture series possible. And uh, the lecture series focuses and uh, uh, hosts distinguished speakers, such as the one we have today, um, and uh, covers topics for a, a, a broad scientific audience. Um, today, it's especially nice to have Shuchi Chawla joining us today. She's uh, from UT Austin, um, where she holds an endowed professorship and is also an Amazon scholar. Her work uh, is on algorithm design, but specifically at the intersection of uh, computation and economics. Um, so before coming to UC Austin, Shuchi spent 15 years at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, and she's won numerous awards for her research and teaching, a Sloan Fellowship, Chancellor's Award for Innovative Teaching, and it's really a pleasure to have her joining us today. The top of, of her talk is Pandora's Box, Learning to Leverage Costly Information. So please join me in welcoming Shuchi. Thank you very much for the introduction, Sandy. Um, this, is, uh, this talk is based on a couple of recent works with these uh, co-authors and the lead student author on the works is right here, Evangelia. And so if you have any technical questions, you know whom to ask. Um, okay, so let me start by uh, saying a few words about the data-driven decision processes program that I'm uh, participating in uh, this semester and how today's talk fits into uh, the framework of this program. Uh, this program is about uh, sequential or online uh, decision processes and, and techniques for uh, that, uh, uh, the, and we're, uh, you know, discussing techniques to solve these kinds of online uh, or sequential uh, decision making processes. And one of the key aspects of uh, these sorts of problems is this lack of information about what input is to arrive in the future. We need to make decisions before we know this entire input. But on the other hand, uh, oftentimes we are also in uh, this uh, uh, setting where we can actually gather a lot of data about uh, uh, this uh, input. So for example, we might have uh, examples of past input that we've seen for the same problem or a model of the input generating process predictions or hints about what's to come in the future and so on. And one of the things we are discussing in this program is how to effectively use this data in our in and incorporate it into decision making. So what about today's talk? Today, our focus will be on settings where this information comes at a cost. So we don't get it for free. And the question is, uh, you know, when should we decide to buy this information uh, in such a way that it actually uh, helps improve uh, the uh, optimization we're carrying out? Okay, so that's the key question. What should we, uh, what pieces of information should we purchase in what order for it to be the most effective from the point of view of optimization? And this sort of problem comes up in many, many different contexts. I have a few examples here from 
like uh, real life examples that we might face as individuals, in fact. Uh, uh, but these kinds of problems arise uh, in, in uh, you know, a variety of different settings. So you can imagine, for instance, a student that's looking to uh, select a college and visits different campuses to figure out how much they, uh, you know, like the place. And every such visit, uh, you know, costs uh, a bit in terms of both time and effort and money. Uh, and so, you know, the question is, where should they go? And maybe they don't want to visit all of the different places uh, on their list, right? Uh, likewise, imagine that you are looking to buy a piece of furniture uh, and, uh, you know, you visit uh, various different stores to find the best deal. You know, what is the order in which you should go to these stores? When should you decide you've seen enough and you, you just want to buy the best you've seen so far? Likewise, when you're trying to purchase a house, you know, should you get it inspected? It comes at a cost. Uh, the, you know, which houses should you look at first, et cetera? Or if you're trying to recruit uh, a specialist, uh, you might invest uh, time or effort or money into, you know, uh, trying them out or interviewing them uh, before you make a selection. Okay, and in all of these different contexts, uh, so there's a, a cost for, uh, uh, you know, getting the next piece of information and it has some effect on how well uh, at the end of the day you'll be able to run your optimization. And we're going to talk about a very nice and simple model that was uh, proposed by uh, Martin Weitzman back in 1979 that captures precisely this kind of trade-off between the cost of information and the benefit it provides uh, in the optimization problem. So in this uh, problem that Weitzman called Pandora's problem, uh, Pandora has a bunch of different boxes that contain unknown costs in them. Uh, so his original problem was uh, in the, the context of uh, rewards contained inside boxes. We'll talk about costs today. So every box contains a cost and our underlying uh, optimization problem is very simple. We just want to find the box with the smallest cost. We, uh, at the end of the process, we'll be choosing one box out of these N and the cost of this box is, uh, uh, is the objective we're trying to minimize. And at the beginning, all we know is that these costs are drawn according to some distributions and we know these distributions. But furthermore, before we make our selection, we can open any of these boxes to reveal the precise cost contained inside them. And this opening comes at a, at a certain further cost that I'll call a probing penalty. And so, for example, you know, the algorithm might decide to open box one, pay T1 for opening this, and realizes this uh, cost C1 that's drawn from this distribution. And then at this point, uh, the algorithm might decide to open box three to get more information uh, and pays uh, the penalty of T3, realizes the cost C3. And the process could continue in this fashion until at some point the algorithm decides that uh, it's seen enough and then it makes a choice. So perhaps it uh, picks this cost, uh, this box three. And so the total loss of the algorithm is going to be the cost of this chosen box, that's C3 here, plus the total penalty the algorithm paid for opening whichever boxes it opened. Okay. And this is the total quantity we want to minimize. Okay. So I'll point out here that uh, you know, there are lots of contexts in which we place uh, a cost of uh, on uh, information and oftentimes the way we formalize it into the, an optimization setting is to you know uh, place a budget on how much we can spend on gathering this information so this is quite a different model in that it sets up this direct trade-off between how much you pay for information and uh, and how it affects your optimization by bringing this cost straight into the objective. Okay, and that's what uh, makes uh, this uh, Pandora's box uh, model a little bit different from other kind of budgeted settings that you might be familiar with. So, yeah. do we have to probe uh, the box we select? Very good question. So for this talk, I will assume we have to probe the box uh, that uh, we select, uh, but I'll talk very briefly about the, the, the non-obligatory setting as well. 
and we always have <clears throat> you, you must select at least one box. Yes. So we're in this cost minimization setting. We must select at least one box. Otherwise, you know, we could have just uh, yeah. So this is a requirement. Yeah. Is there recall or can you go back to a box that you are? Yes, so you can go back to a box you've seen before. So when you stop, you could look at all of the boxes you've seen before and you could pick the best of them, the cheapest of them. Thank you all great questions and please feel free to continue to ask questions. Okay, so what does a solution to this problem look like? So there are two things an algorithm needs to do. It needs to figure out which box to probe next and when it should stop and make a selection. And once it decides to stop, it just chooses the cheapest box it's seen so far. And in general, both of these uh, decisions can depend on all of the information the algorithm has uh, uh, seen so far. So in general, uh, a, a strategy for this problem looks like a decision tree where you know you make uh, some probes and then depending on the outcomes of these probes, you decide what to do next. And so at this point, uh, you know, the natural next question is, well, how large can this tree be? You know, this looks uh, kind of complicated. And, uh, you know, if, it, if it's large, can we represent it succinctly somehow? And is it efficiently computable? Those are the next questions, uh, of course, we uh, ask as algorithm designers. And the upshot, and I'll talk about these uh, in some more detail, of course, but the upshot is that the tree can indeed be uh, exponential in size, the optimal tree. Uh, we don't know, or I don't know of any uh, uh, results about whether it's succinctly representable, but in terms of computability, the upshot is that it's going to be hard to compute. And I'll say more, uh, I'll go into more details uh, in a little bit. But so at this point, our goal then will be to ask, well, when can we uh, approximate it, or what can we approximate, or, or what can we optimize over? Okay. So this is what happens in general, uh, but let's go back to Weitzman's work from 79. What did uh, Weitzman show? Well, he came up with a very, uh, very nice and elegant algorithm for solving Pandora's box under certain settings. And I'll describe this algorithm to you through uh, a picture here. Uh, it, it won't be directly relevant to uh, what I have to say later, but it's, it's kind of a very nice uh, uh, algorithm to know about. So what this does is it computes uh, indices for each of the boxes. Uh, and uh, these are just like uh, pretend costs for the boxes. And I use, I'm using GI to denote these indices because these are the same as uh, Giddens indices. Uh, if uh, the, some of you know what Giddens indices are, turns out that Weitzman independently came up with uh, the same solution as Giddens did to this sort of a problem. Uh, okay, so what this does is uh, essentially these indices are a way of taking the probing penalties and amortizing them in a certain way so that they can be absorbed into the costs of the boxes. And now we can just forget about all the probing penalties and just ask to uh, uh, the, the, you know, find the, the box with the cheapest cost with these pretend costs. And so what is the algorithm going to do? Well, uh, once we compute these indices, uh, we're gonna open the cheapest one. These are now our pretend costs. Okay, and so we open this and we observe the true cost in this box and maybe it turns out to be this C1. And at this point, we still have some boxes that have indices or pretend costs that are smaller than the one we observed. And so we continue opening them. We open uh, the second box and then we open the third box. And at some point we find a box where the true cost in the box is uh, smaller than everything else, uh, uh, you know, either uh, other observed costs or pretend costs of the boxes we haven't opened yet. And that's the one, the one we select, okay? So the thing to notice is uh, first, these indices are um, easy to compute. They're only functions of every individual box. 
And second, you know, there's no adaptivity here in the probing order. You just compute these indices and we're gonna open boxes in this or increasing order of their pretend costs. Okay, so much nicer and simpler than uh, a large decision tree uh, that might uh, uh, appear in general. So, so uh, Weitzman showed that in fact, this simple algorithm turns out to be optimal under the assumption that these cost distributions are independent. Okay. And I told you, of course, uh, a few minutes ago that, uh, you know, in general, uh, we're not going to get this nice structure. So it also turns out that this uh, theorem is quite brittle and it breaks as soon as we change some little facet of uh, the, uh, the setting. Okay, so here are some uh, uh, settings where uh, this theorem fail, fails to hold. Uh, Non-obligatory inspection, this is uh, what Ola mentioned. This is when you can actually select boxes without opening them. So you don't have to open a box to select it. Um, you know, I can choose a, a college to go to without visiting the campus. Another setting where it breaks is when costs are correlated. This is, uh, you know, already in the theorem statement. So, for instance, you know, I go to a public university and decide that I don't like it very much, which indicates I probably don't like other public universities. So that gives me some information about how, uh, the, what kind of a scenario or world I'm in. And if costs are correlated in this fashion, then again, uh, a Weitzman solution uh, uh, breaks, approach breaks. Another setting is uh, if we are in some sort of combinatorial context where uh, you know, we uh, uh, select multiple boxes or we're required to select multiple boxes and we have some combinatorial feasibility constraint uh, and uh, work of Sahil here who's in the audience uh, does a very nice job of uh, uh, explaining where Weitzman's algorithm works and where it doesn't. Uh, and it turns out that in, in many settings, uh, it doesn't work. Uh, another related context is uh, this uh, problem called attribute selection, which is of a similar na nature where uh, decisions of, uh, over uh, boxes uh, are required to be uh, correlated in, in some sense, in, in a combinatorial sense. And uh, once again, this kind of approach uh, fails to work. Okay. So the question we wanna ask uh, in this talk is, uh, you know, in these uh, more general settings where we don't have a nice structure on the solution uh, of the uh, optimal on the optimal strategy, what can we say about learning and approximation? And I'll focus in this talk on uh, the setting of correlated costs, but some of the observations we make will also apply to other settings. Okay, so as I said, uh, our goal is to develop an algorithm for finding uh, a probing strategy for this problem. And here are some keywords to keep in mind. So we want to be able to compute the strategy efficiently. Uh, we want uh, some sort of uh, approximation guarantee, but also we'll talk about learning in this context. And we'll talk about how much we need to know about the underlying cost distribution in order to be able to do this computation. Okay, so that's the sense in which learning will come in here. Okay, and in the rest of the talk, I'll start by uh, talking about some different distributional models uh, for correlated costs. Uh, and then we'll talk about some uh, algorithmic components that we need to be able to solve in order to construct a solution to Pandora's box. And we'll try to understand those in isolation, and then we'll put things together to come up with uh, some results. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, so uh, here are the two distributional settings I'll talk about. So again, we uh, have uh, costs inside these n different boxes that we can open uh, and reveal. And at the end of the day, we want to select one box uh, and, uh, and get its cost. And in general, these costs are going to be distributed according to some joint distribution. And when we have these joint distributions, this is over an n dimensional space. These can be very complicated distributions. Uh, 
And so these, uh, these two models are uh, sort of uh, very natural first models that one might think of in this uh, sort of uh, um, high dimensional context. The first one is uh, just a small support distribution. So uh, something of this sort. Uh, so here we have three boxes. And so uh, cost vectors are, uh, are three dimensional vectors. And you know this is just a distribution with uh, some uh, uh, small number of vectors in its support and some uh, uh, distribution over those. Okay, so we could be given something explicit like this. And here the complexity of the distribution will be the number of different cost vectors that can appear. And in general, uh, the, you know, we should expect that uh, our algorithms, runtimes or performance guarantees to depend on this uh, quantity. And then we'll also look at settings where the distribution is completely arbitrary. So we don't have uh, you know, an explicit model of it, but we are given M samples drawn from it. And the samples here are again going to be these cost vectors. So the M samples, uh, I'm uh, deliberately using the same M here because the M samples, uh, the empirical distribution will look something exactly something like this. Yeah. Okay. And now let me talk about what goes into constructing a strategy for Pandora's box. And there are uh, you know, a few different components uh, we need to uh, be able to solve in order to design a solution. So uh, one is that uh, you know, when we open boxes, they're giving us multiple kinds of information. They're both telling us what kind of uh, world we are in. Okay, so uh, the, by uh, state of the world, I really mean, you know, what is our, our cost vector, right? So our distribution is a distribution over cost vectors. And every time I open a particular box, so if I open this one and I observe a cost of eight, I know that I'm in one of these three the different uh, potential states of the world. And so one of the things opening a box tells me is uh, information about which state I'm in. Another thing it does is helps me find the low cost box. So <clears throat> we want to be able to gain information, but we also want to be able to um, uh, find the low cost box. So there's some tension between uh, these two components. Okay. And then, of course, we need to know when to stop. And so as we're gathering information and finding smaller and smaller costs, when have we done enough? And now we can stop and uh, make a choice. That's uh, another component here. And finally, we'll uh, need to talk about how we might learn uh, in uh, the setting where we only have samples from the underlying distribution. We think of the sampling version model as a noisy version of the uh, uniform distribution, like scenario based approach. Not quite noisy, quite but uh, you you can think of uh, you know once you draw the samples, then you can think of an empirical distribution over these samples. Uh, and then you can uh, think about what you can do with that empirical distribution. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we can you know grapple with the standard, uh, learning question, which is, you know, are these samples enough to for me to be able to generalize to the entire distribution, whatever result I get over the empirical distribution? Yeah. So, could the correlation structure be in a way that, let's say, after opening two boxes, I know exactly the value of, let's say, the remaining show? I should still pay an extra probing cost or no? Yeah, yeah. So, that's a, a good question. So, in this model, we are uh, this is an uh, obligatory inspection uh, that we're talking about. So uh, once you have identified which state of the world you're in, you still have to go. And if you haven't already uh, seen a good low cost box for that state, you might need to go and pay the probing cost for that. Uh, but th that's uh, a decision the algorithm can make. Maybe it's already seen a good enough uh, box, uh, or maybe uh, it knows that uh, you know it's worthwhile to for uh, another new box. Okay. okay, so I'll talk about each of these and I'll go in sort of uh, uh, the, a different order than uh, top to bottom. Uh, so let's talk about uh, knowing when to stop, so the stopping rule here. 
And I'm starting with this because it turns out that this problem is actually very easy to solve approximately. Okay, so first of all, the optimal stopping rule can be very, very complex because the underlying distribution can be very, very complex, right? So there, the, uh, you know, you could have some strange kinds of correlations between costs and your stopping rule could depend on uh, sort of untangling those uh, correlations. But it turns out that we can get uh, a very good approximation very easily. And the way we do this is uh, a stopping rule that I'll call myopic stopping. And basically what it does is, uh, you know, once you specify uh, a decision tree for probing, once you know how to probe, it's going to just keep track of the total cost we paid for probing. So it's gonna keep track of this total probing penalty. And as soon as this probing penalty exceeds the best solution I've seen so far, we're gonna stop and accept that best solution. Okay, and if you've seen uh, sort of uh, the, the ski rental problem or the rent or buy problem before in online algorithms, this is exactly the solution to that problem. But let me also show you a, a very quick analysis of why this is a good idea. So uh, we have some probing strategy, some order in which we're going to probe boxes. And the, the thing to note here is that if I plot the, the, the penalty, uh, the probing penalty that my algorithm is paying, uh, this is a little blurry and uh, my apologies for that, uh, but you don't need to see what's written here, just the colors. So this, this orange is uh, tracking the total probing penalty I'm paying over time. And the blue here is tracking the cost of the best solution I've seen so far. So the least cost box uh, in our current context. And this myopic stopping, what it says is, we're gonna stop as soon as these, uh, the, the blue line and the orange line cross each other. And the observation is that anywhere else along this timeline, either the blue function is higher or the orange function is higher. Okay, and so our total cost, which is the sum of these, and, and it's depicted by this green here, is going to be uh, you know, at least as large as the, uh, the penalty or the cost we have at this point, but we're paying no more than twice this point, we're paying the sum of these. Okay, so basically this myopic stopping is going to be a two approximation to even the hindsight optimal stopping. So if I could just run this process forever and observe what this hindsight optimal stopping time is, I'm still within a factor of two of that. And if I use a little bit of randomness, uh, we can even improve this uh, slightly. And again, this is uh, exactly like uh, how randomness helps with the ski rental problem. So yeah. Like yeah, two approximation of the like the way you're selecting your open the box so it's not on the best path. it's saying that if i fix a, a probing strategy a probing meaning, for how, this one yeah, for this best. particular probing strategy okay, okay. yes my uh, cost by going to myopic stopping as opposed to some other stopping rule is yeah. going to be no more than twice yeah. uh, you know, the optimal yeah. um, so sometimes in the there's some problem a reward from each box. So can we still design a similar strategy for this kind of version? So that's a really good question. And there's a, a reason I'm talking about costs here. With rewards, you, you get a mixed objective where you, you know, you uh, get the you're trying to maximize the reward, but you're paying the probing penalty. And with a mixed objective, uh, you know, things get uh, very messy, and in fact, no good approximations uh, are possible. So you can show uh, some very large uh, gaps. So yeah, this does not work out if you have the words. From the point of view of optimality, so settings where, uh, like for instance, uh, the Bison's solution works. There is no difference between cost and rewards. But from the point of view of approximation, they can be very different. And so we can talk more offline. Okay. 
So the upshot here is that uh, I don't really need to worry about knowing the best stopping time. Uh, in fact, we don't need any further information about the setting in order to be able to do approximately optimally, even against the hindsight optimal stopping rule. So that's one problem we can move out of the way. And next, let's talk about the problem of finding a low cost box quickly. Okay. And here I want to talk about uh, a special case of the Pandora's box problem, which is uh, the, an optimization problem that's been studied extensively uh, in, uh, you know, motivated by other contexts uh, as well. And this is called the min sum set cover problem. And this is essentially the special case where all of the boxes are going to contain costs that are zero or infinity. Okay, so I want you to think of this as a setting where uh, boxes come with uh, uh, you know, a note inside that says this is acceptable or this is unacceptable. Okay, and all we want to do is we want to find an acceptable box. And as soon as we can find an acceptable box, we, we end the process, okay? So uh, here's a, a really quick example of this. We have five scenarios. These are the rows here. We have four boxes. These are the columns here. And every box in every scenario is going to be acceptable or unacceptable. And again, we are going to try out and open these boxes one at a time. And we're trying to minimize how many boxes we need to open before we find an acceptable one. So for example, if we open this box first, if it were the case that we were in this scenario or this scenario, then uh, you know, we, we can stop. This box is already acceptable. And we'll think of you know, the scenarios as being, getting covered by these boxes, uh, by this particular box. And we end these scenarios with a penalty of one, total penalty of one. But if we're not in these scenarios, then we need to go and open another box. And maybe we open this one, and this one covers uh, the second row and the fourth row, both of the, it's acceptable for both of those uh, scenarios. And those scenarios now have a penalty of two, okay, because we opened two boxes. And if we are in this first scenario, we still haven't found uh, an acceptable box yet. And maybe we open this one. And then again, the process ends. And now our penalty is three. So the total penalty we paid is, is uh, uh, the weighted average of these weighted according to the uh, probabilities of the scenarios. And uh, so this is called the min sum set cover problem because uh, you know, we're summing the penalties and kind of each penalty is how quickly you covered a scenario uh, with uh, uh, these sets. These are our sets. So, so that's uh, a problem, and it's it's a, a special case of Pandora's box because uh, you know it has this nice uh, special cost structure. And this is again a problem that uh, turns out to be easy to solve. So anything with a constant approximation, I'll, I'll term easy, and anything without, uh, you know, will be a hard problem. So this is NP-hard. Okay, let's uh, just state that. Uh, you know, it's not completely easy. Uh, it captures uh, uh, maximum coverage style problems, but it turns out that a very simple greedy algorithm, as you might expect, gives a, a good enough. Uh, approximation and this greedy algorithm simply says, well, we'll just uh, you know pick the box that covers the most scenarios and then uh, at the next step pick the one that covers the most remaining scenarios and so on. Okay, so very natural kind of algorithm. Okay. So there are multiple ways of, of getting this for approximation and it's also known to be tight, so you can't do better than for uh, in polynomial time. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll consider this to be basically a solved and well understood problem. But it doesn't quite 
uh, you know, it's, it's strictly less general than Pandora's box in a sense, because, you know, it doesn't quite capture the, uh, you know, this informational structure where when you open a box, maybe it has a very high cost inside it, but it might still be a good idea to open it if it gives us good information about, uh, you, know, you know, what else, uh, what state of the world we are in. And uh, this problem doesn't quite capture that structure. Okay. So that brings us to this first problem here, which is how quickly can we gather information about which world we're in? Okay. And here I want to tell you about another related problem which has been extensively studied. This is called the optimal decision tree problem. And it's uh, the following problem. So here uh, we are not interested in uh, finding a low cost box. We're just interested in finding what state of the world we're in. Okay, and this, this problem has a lot of different applications. Uh, you know, for instance, disease diagnosis. Okay, so now the boxes are like tests and they reveal some information about uh, the underlying states of the world to us. And we want to figure out, you know, how many tests do we need to run before we, we get a firm diagnosis? Okay, so there's a, a long line of literature on this in many, many applications. And uh, it captures this particular aspect of uh, Pandora's box. So what's known about this problem? So this is uh, known to be NP-hard even when these tests are binary, the prior is uniform. So like the nicest version of this problem is already NP-hard. And the challenge really uh, in, for this problem is that, uh, you know, there's, uh, so you're, you're running these tests, opening these boxes, and you're gathering information about the world piecemeal. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's difficult to uh, sort of quantify uh, the, uh, the gain of information in a manner that's uh, algorithmically, that's amenable to uh, algorithmic techniques. So information gain can be a, a, a very difficult quantity to work with. Uh, and so uh, there's a long line of work on this. And uh, there are these two sort of uh, primary techniques that have um, uh, that have been useful in uh, developing approximations here. One is to uh, come up with some sort of nice proxy function for information gain that lends itself to uh, good approximations. And another is to sort of uh, greedily and successively eliminate uh, uh, large uh, 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 sets of scenarios uh, and, and do that in a, uh, an iterative fashion. So it turns out that uh, one can get a, a, a log in M approximation for this problem. M, uh, recall, is the number of different states of the world. So, uh, and, and this also turns out to be tight in general. So uh, with an arbitrary prior over the states of the world, uh, there's an omega of log M lower bound on what you can do uh, in polynomial time. Uh, okay, so, uh, and then I'll just quickly mention that there's a nice special case where this prior is uniform and here there's a big gap uh, in uh, what we know uh, uh, for, for that particular setting. So nice open question if you're looking for one. Okay, so the upshot is that we can solve this sort of uh, exploration or isolation problem uh, when there are few states of the world. So when M is small, and we are happy to tolerate this logarithmic in M uh, approximation, uh, you know, at least we can uh, uh, try to express our problem as an optimal decision tree problem uh, and get a solution that way. Okay, so this is what we know so far. We know when to stop if we have a probing rule and we know how to approximately solve the exploration problem uh, when M is small. And we'll talk about learning uh, in a few minutes, but uh, let's already uh, you know, talk about how we can synthesize these pieces to uh, get an algorithm for Pandora's box in the setting where we have this explicitly described uh, distribution. So now we have these M states of the world, we're given this model explicitly. 
And essentially, this boils down to making connections between these problems uh, I talked about. And so I said that uh, you know, optimal decision tree solves the, the problem of learning information about the world, but it doesn't have to deal with costs. Min sum set cover uh, you know, actually does not capture uh, the informational aspect. Uh, and so uh, instead, we uh, consider a version of min, set, min sum set cover that incorporates feedback. So you still have zero infinite costs inside boxes, but these zeros and infinities carry along with them uh, you know, information about what state of the world you're in. And with these definitions, one can show that Pandora's box is essentially equivalent to min sum set cover. And these reduce in turn to optimal decision tree. And this reduction here is essentially the observation that once you can figure out the state of the world, uh, you know, you, you can exploit the state of the world. So uh, I won't go into details here, but this, this turns out to be relatively uh, a straightforward reduction to do with slight losses uh, in, in various places. The interesting reduction here is going from Pandora's box where we have these different costs and boxes, and then taking those costs and replacing them with boxes being acceptable or unacceptable uh, for different scenarios. Okay, so how might one do that? This is where uh, uh, you know some um, care uh, needs to be taken. And essentially the idea is that uh, we need to figure out algorithmically some threshold uh, for determining whether uh, you know, a cost is uh, low enough to be acceptable or too high uh, and becomes uh, unacceptable. And we, we need to pick an appropriate threshold that covers enough scenarios, but not too many, so we can relate it to the optimal cost. And uh, so this kind of a guess and iterate technique leads to a log log loss in approximation. And so the first result that I'll state here is this log m log log m approximation for Pandora's box where m is the number of uh, scenarios. So I said before that optimal decision tree uh, is hard to approximate better than a logarithmic factor. We don't know the same for Pandora's box. So maybe there, there's uh, the one can do much better here. But currently, uh, my belief is that you have to incur something that will get worse with the, the number of scenarios M. Okay, that you can't get away with some dependence on the number of scenarios. And so I want to talk next about the setting where the, the number of scenarios is potentially very, very large or even unbounded. So you have like an unbounded support distribution and then uh, and, and we get sample access to this distribution. And now I wanna ask, well, you know, can we say something interesting? If with finite support, this is the best we can do, can we say anything interesting about the case where M is unbounded? Yeah. It would be possible to comment a bit on the reduction. One you present it as a kind of exploitation problem, whereas the other one is exploitation. So what is the kind of underlying structure? Yes, so here, uh, you know, the idea is that I want to find a, a, an acceptable box quickly, but now I'm adding in this uh, extra, uh, you know, feedback about the state of the world into the problem. So now that this is a more general problem than what I described on the previous slide. So again, the difference from Pandora's box is that now we only have acceptable and unacceptable boxes, but we still get some feedback about the state of the world we're in. And the connection to optimal decision tree is that, in fact, this is a simpler problem than uh, optimal decision tree because we don't have to identify exactly which state of the world we're in as long as we find an acceptable box, right? So certainly identification will help us with this task 
Okay, but uh, but here we don't have to identify the state of the world, uh, and so it's a it's a simpler problem. And uh, uh, I can tell you offline more about the reduction, but it's basically based off of that idea. Yes, so I'll I'll talk about the sample axis setting. So um, here we have some underlying distribution over cost vectors. And we again want to uh, find an approximately optimal probing strategy, but all we get to see about this distribution is a few draws from it. So polynomially many draws, polynomial in the number of boxes. Okay. We don't get to see the entire distribution. Yeah. So if we find a better approximation that is separate, you said that you. Correct. If we find a better approximation, it will separate the two problems. Okay, so let's talk about this uh, last piece, the learning from uh, limited data. And the upshot here is that the problem is completely hopeless in the setting. Okay, so here is an example uh, to convince you of that. So imagine that uh, our distribution over costs is such that the first box, this is going to be a cheap to probe box, but it, it contains complete information about uh, you know, the, the location of another box that has uh, zero cost inside it, okay? So in every state of the world, there's going to be a single zero cost box. We don't know where the, the, which box that is, but the first box is going to tell us complete information about it. So if only we can decipher the message in the first box, we can, uh, you know, there, there's this very simple probing strategy that will find the location of the zero cost box and will be done. Okay, but deciphering this without actually observing uh, the, this uh, particular uh, instantiation in our sample, uh, is just not possible. So unless we see precisely the same uh, state of the world in our sample, uh, we uh, cannot hope to do this. Okay, and so uh, this is, uh, it's kind of a, a silly example uh, in the sense that, uh, you know, it doesn't really capture uh, anything very interesting about the problem at hand. It's just saying that, uh, you know, you, you cannot just, uh, if, if your distribution is completely arbitrary, then you're not asking the right question. Okay, that's how uh, I think of it at least. Yeah. So you have offline uh, a K sample from each box. No, we have offline some poly and N samples from the entire distribution. So each sample now is going to be an entire vector of costs. And I'll give you poly and N such vectors. Okay, so, right, so we cannot hope to learn the optimal strategy or anything close to it from data. But now my claim is that we're, this is because we're asking the wrong question. We have the wrong benchmark here. So I wanna talk about benchmarks here. And uh, this is often a, a conversation we don't have in the context of algorithm design. What is the benchmark that we ought to approximate? And so we saw that uh, this benchmark that I'll now call the fully adaptive optimum, this is a completely arbitrary decision tree. This is uh, potentially hard to approximate. Uh, okay, I, I told you that the related optimal decision tree problem is log n hard to approximate. I don't know the same for Pandora's box, but it's not a stretch to imagine that uh, it, it would be. So it, it appears to be hard to approximate, and it's also uh, impossible to learn from data. What else could we do? Well, we could go to the other end of the spectrum and ask for a completely non-adaptive solution. So what is a non-adaptive solution here? So it's not gonna, uh, it's going to probe and stop without depending on the data that it's seen, right? So what it does is it, it just selects some subset of the boxes, opens them all simultaneously, and then it just selects the best one out of those. Okay, now the question is which subset should you open? Okay. And 
the good thing about this non-adaptive optimum is that it's easy to learn from data in the sense that, uh, you know, in uh, machine learning terms, if I think about the generalization error, uh, I just have very few different, uh, uh, you know, uh, solutions in this space. I only have two to the n different subsets of boxes. So polynomially in n samples is going to give me enough information to tell uh, what the best one is if the costs are bounded. So it's, uh, in that sense, it's easy to learn from data. Samples tell us enough about uh, the, uh, the optimization problem. But it turns out that uh, this non-adaptive optimum is also hard to approximate. So in particular, it captures the set cover problem. And uh, so in fact, it's hard to approximate any better than uh, a log in M uh, approximation. Okay, so now we have these two benchmarks. Both are, uh, are sort of uh, uh, hard in one sense or another. And one of the things you might do at this point is to ask, uh, well, can I approximate the optimum of this, so the, the non-adaptive optimum, by giving my algorithm extra power and using full adaptivity? Okay, and this is uh, the, this would be uh, sort of this would correspond to like improper learning uh, in ML or in in the context of algorithms. It's sort of like a resource augmentation model, and it's a it's a nice question to ask. And it turns out that uh, it's uh, it's really hard to find a fully optimal a fully adaptive strategy that will beat the non-adaptive optimum but you can get a constant approximation. So this is doable. Okay, but I won't talk about this. I'll talk about something uh, better, which is an intermediate class of uh, uh, solutions that we'll try to optimize over. And I'll call these partially adaptive uh, solutions. And these are directly inspired by Weitzman's algorithm. This is why I went through the algorithm at the beginning of the talk. So what these strategies do is uh, they're going to fix a particular probing order over, over boxes before they've seen anything. So the probing order is going to be non-adaptive, but the stopping rule is going to be adaptive. And one can establish, uh, you know, gaps between these different solution concepts. So fully adaptive can be, uh, you know, much, much better than non-adaptive, non of course, but so can partially adaptive be much, much better than non-adaptive. So these are very, very different classes of solutions. And so this is what a partially adaptive strategy looks like. In this picture, you have a, the same probing order, but then you know, the, the stopping rule can now depend on data you've seen so far. And the upshot is that this one, we will be able to approximate and learn from data. Okay. And there's, a, there's this interesting trade-off between learning and optimization going on here. So you know, as I go from uh, left to right, uh, I'm uh, you know, going to a smaller and smaller uh, uh, solution class. And so of course, I'm increasing my representation error, right? This, the, uh, this one doesn't quite uh, capture as much of the optimal value as this one. But as I go from right to left, I'm increasing generalization error. Now I need more and more samples in order to be able to learn the optimum. Uh, and so this is you know, perfectly natural and as we might expect. But uh, the computational complexity of these different classes does not uh, you know, correspond to the scale at all. This one is, is challenging to approximate. This one's challenging to approximate. This one turns out to be easy to approximate. So that's, that's quite a mystery. That's quite uh, interesting, uh, I think. Okay, so let me tell you how we can approximate this. And we've already seen uh, the, the various components. So we'll be able to put them together quickly. So now again, we're in the setting where we have some arbitrary distribution and we have samples drawn from this distribution available to us. And the first thing we'll do is to simplify the stopping rule. As we saw, we can do this at small loss, okay? So we're going to just 
worry about coming up with a good probing order. And once we have a good probing order, then we're going to just use myopic stopping alongside uh, to get a final solution. And now the, the key observation is that, you know, these uh, partially adaptive strategies with this fixed stopping rule, there are only n factorial different, uh, you know, n factorial many different strategies in my set. Uh, we're going to assume that the costs are bounded, and this is enough to say that this uh, this class is is learnable. Okay, polynomial in n many samples will suffice to be able to find uh, a good solution in the set. Okay, and that's all that I'll say about learning. But now that we draw these samples, so we saw uh, we draw m samples from the distribution. Now we'll just worry about finding an approximately optimal solution over these samples. Okay, and now what we'll do is we'll take inspiration from uh, this long line of work on min sum set cover. And it turns out that the min sum set cover problem without uh, feedback about the state of the world, you know, naturally has uh, a partially adaptive probing order that's optimal. Okay, and so here, uh, the, the, this, this partial adaptivity, the fact that the probing order is fixed, it, it, comes in very handy in setting up uh, an LP relaxation for this problem. And one can set this up and uh, do a rounding. I won't go into the details, but this gives a, a constant approximation. Again, okay, I also wanna point out here that, uh, so now we're in this world with few samples, but note that we are only competing or we're only trying to approximate partially adaptive strategies, not fully adaptive strategies. And so that's why we, we are able to get this constant approximation and we don't have to suffer a logarithmic in M approximation. Okay, so the upshot is that uh, we get a constant approximation to the partially adaptive optimum this runs in polynomial time and it uses polynomially many samples from the underlying distribution. Okay, so to quickly wrap up, I talked about these two different models of the distribution, the explicitly described distribution where we can get like a, a log, log, log approximation to the fully adaptive optimum. And then the sample access setting where we can get a constant approximation, but only to the partially adaptive optimum. And these are just, you know, these two different uh, uh, natural models of distribution, but you can of course ask, you know, what if I, I knew something else about my distribution? What else can I do? And, you know, we already know that uh, in special cases, we can do much better product distribution, Weitzman's algorithm. Uh, you know, gives the optimal solution. And so I want to, you know, in the, the last few seconds, just quickly mention another very nice model, uh, distributional model for which we don't know very much. And uh, I think it's a, it's a nice uh, setting to explore and try to do uh, something for. This is, uh, you know, this combines sort of different aspects of these other models. So Weitzman's algorithm says that the costs in different boxes are independent of each other. We could imagine that, uh, you know, maybe there are a few different states of the world. And in each state, we are given some, we have some product distribution, right? So these product distributions could, for example, correspond to uh, some noise, some independent noise uh, added to the costs in each box. Okay, but we don't know which world we are in. So we have a mixture over few product distributions. Okay, so now we have a very uh, specific kind of underlying distribution. Maybe we even have, uh, you know, an explicit model of this. What can we do in this setting? And uh, we don't know very much about this. So it turns out that we can get uh, a logarithmic approximation. So putting us somewhere close to this in polynomial time, or we can get uh, something like a close to one approximation, but in time that's exponential uh, in M. Okay, but uh, again, the, we don't know any lower bounds here. So uh, it's quite possible that one can do much better. Okay, 
So to wrap up, uh, I already mentioned a few different directions for exploration here. Uh, you know, other models of correlation, uh, uh, better results, you know, closing the gaps, some of the gaps I mentioned, other benchmarks. This is another direction that I, I think would be very nice to think about for these kinds of problems that exhibit large gaps. What are other reasonable benchmarks to try to uh, approximate? I very briefly mentioned combinatorial selection. And uh, it turns out that the sorts of techniques I described tend to extend to uh, matroid type settings, but don't go beyond. And so a very nice question is, you know, what can we say uh, about uh, the combinatorial settings where we go beyond matroids? There's a very nice question in Singla's work, which asks about, uh, you know, shortest paths in a network. You can probe the lengths of edges. Can you find uh, the, with low cost, uh, the shortest path uh, in a given network? Okay, and finally, I uh, wanna, uh, again, make this connection to uh, budgeted or constrained settings where we have some budget on how much we can spend to gain information. And of course, we can define the cost of information in many, many different ways, like sample complexity, query complexity, et cetera. And one can imagine Pandora's box style models with these uh, cost measures that you know, uh, internalize this cost uh, of uh, information. And uh, these would be interesting directions to explore as well. And thank you very much. So, can you comment a little bit on the other sorts of correlations that uh, for which for which there are results now? Like? Yeah, I mentioned I have a couple of um, uh, references here, so it's definitely not complete. But um, there's uh, uh, so in the in the context of attribute selection, which I didn't quite define uh, in the talk. This is where um, it, you know you uh, either select everything or nothing, uh, and so you're uh, you know gaining some information and trying to decide should I select everything or not? Is it uh, you know is the net value uh, greater than some threshold or not? Uh, and there, uh, there have been models people have looked at of uh, uh, you know, uh, sort of pairwise correlation between, uh, so now the boxes are called attributes, and, and so uh, uh, sort of uh, you know, small uh, correlations between consecutive attributes. Uh, and I'll just point you to these couple of references, and I'm, I'm happy to tell you more offline. Uh, but they're you know very specific kinds of models that arise in, in certain applications. The fact that you mentioned in the minimum sum set cover, what would that look like? Because it's just the, it's just zeros and ones, right? Yeah, so it would be uh, uh, as if uh, you know the box had has two different attributes in it. So one is the, the cost, acceptable or unacceptable. And the second is uh, uh, is some uh, you know hint about the state of the work. Oh, so that would be like yeah. a separate. So it would be a separate uh, piece of information. Yeah. Thank you. So the optimal decision tree problem that you use, that's the one where log M hardness is known or there's hope that it's like a uniform distribution, some special case where- So for optimal decision tree, uh, the, the reduction that I showed actually reduces it to the uniform prior version. So, uh, you know, it still has the log, log M loss, and, but uh, if there's an improvement on the factor for that uniform prior, then the, this would uh, also improve. Uh, but the, the log M hardness is for the non-uniform prior version. Uh, and actually, the, the, as you probably know, the latest work on the uniform prior uh, optimal decision tree uh, actually gives an approximation better than log M, strictly better than log M. So it breaks that, uh, that hardness. So there's a gap between the two versions. 